Welcome. I'm Fred Moulton. I'm a member of the Executive Committee of the Libertarian Futures Society. Today, the Libertarian Futures Society is presenting awards. Uh, two awards are being presented, the Prometheus Award, and the, uh, this award is for the best libertarian science fiction novel of 1999. And also, we're presenting the Hall of Fame Award. <clears throat> the Libertarian Futures Society is an organization with a focus on libertarian science fiction. The Libertarian Futures uh, Society uh, has given these awards for many years and uh, is continuing uh, the efforts to uh, investigate, promote uh, libertarianism and science fiction. The kinds of uh, fiction that is appreciated by members of the Libertarian Future Society contain themes of resistance to authority, the value of personal integrity, and the opposition to uh, censorship, amongst others. <clears throat> the uh, first award we're going to have is uh, the Prometheus Award, and the presentation of that award will be done by Wendy McElroy. Uh, Wendy is a uh, well-known uh, libertarian nonfiction writer, author of such works as XXX, A Woman's Right to Pornography, and The Reasonable Woman, a contributing editor to Liberty and Ideas on Liberty. Uh, she is uh, less known as an SF writer, uh, or, or, or is rather an, an aspiring SF writer. Uh, she has uh, worked as a script writer, syndicated uh, uh, TV program Friday the 13th of uh, the series, contributed to anthologies such as Free Space and things such as Amazing. Hello. I'm delighted to be mistress uh, at the 2000 Prometheus Awards. My name, as Fred mentioned, is usually associated with nonfiction on that side of libertarianism, and with reason, that's where most of my writing has been. Nevertheless, my introduction to libertarianism came through science fiction, namely through Ayn Rand's futuristic novelette, Anthem. And this is a common observation in the movement. People come to libertarianism through fiction. They come through Ayn Rand, they come through Robert Heinlein, they come through L. Neil Smith. L. Neil Smith, when he established the Prometheus Awards, was acknowledging the political contributions that fiction makes to libertarianism, to the future of freedom. He recognized the political importance, namely that it fires the imagination, it fires the vision of man and of woman, and is absolutely essential to inspire people toward freedom. Having said this, another reason that L. Neal forged the Prometheus Awards is in recognition of how excellent science fiction in libertarianism truly is. Just as science fiction, just as, as libertarianism seems to dominate the internet, so too does science fiction provide a natural home for libertarianism. And perhaps this is natural, perhaps this is inevitable. Because libertarianism is the ideology that celebrates man, technology, the future, and the synergy of all three elements together. At the best, this synergy produces works like my favorite novelette in all of SF, which is Werner Vigny's True Names. At its worst, it's usually a really good ride. The Prometheus Awards every single year acknowledges and recognizes the best in both of both aspects, the blending of both. The impetus toward freedom that is provided by libertarian science fiction and just the true excellence in writing that is embodied by it. And this year, I am pleased to say that we are looking back on 1999 for the Prometheus Award finalists, and to read them in order, the nominees are Moon War by Ben Bova, 
Avon Books, Rogue Star by Michael Flynn, Tora Books, Y2K, The Millennium Bug by Don L. Tigre, Ex Libris, The Golden Globe by John Varley, Berkeley, Mask, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Deepness in the Sky. I'm sorry, I read from the list that's in front of me. <laughs> and the winner is Werner Vinge for A Deepness in the Sky. Thank you very much for this this award. Uh, I have I have always uh, appreciated the possibility of being able to get get this award. I, I, I got one several years ago. And I really appreciated that. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be around at the time that that was uh, uh, given out. Nevertheless, it was very uh, gr gratefully received. I was very honored by it. Um, When Fred uh, uh, asked me whether I was going to be around uh, at the Worldcon, uh, he suggested that I also make some remarks in uh, accepting the award. And uh, I, I have some, some biograph autobiographical remarks uh, that may be interesting just in the, in the journey that a person goes through to being uh, uh, favorably interested in, in libertarianism and anarcho-capitalism. Uh, in fact, Wendy and I were talking before the uh, uh, ceremony today about where different people come from uh, uh, to arrive here. Um, and actually, my, my route may, may be somewhat uh, in the minority. Uh, I don't think that I could uh, be counted as a libertarian un until I was uh, um, about 36 years old. Uh, I, I grew up in a um, liberal academic uh, family, and uh, I can remember sitting around the dinner table when I was about age uh, five or six and asking questions like, "Well, this business about if you're a member of if you're if you're working at a job that you have to be a member of a union, um, where is the morality in that?" I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> Uh, and I was assured that this would all make sense to me once I had, had grown up and appreciated the subtleties of the situation. <laughs> um, in the, uh, as a young adult, um, I, I would say I certainly wasn't a libertarian. I, I was aware of sorts of questions about liberty, and I was very intrigued by uh, the notion of anarchy. Uh, I had a story that came out in, in Analog, I think in 1967, that was, about, uh, uh, we were not exactly invaded. Uh, uh, aliens showed up, significantly superior to us. And they were anarchists. And the point of the story was that it really didn't matter too much what they were, because they were so far beyond, they were sufficiently far beyond us that they could, they could treat us like invading Europeans. Uh, in fact, the human race came out relatively better than most of the people that Europeans invaded. But uh, ne nevertheless, there was a, 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 a real lot of um, uh, unhappiness about the situation. Uh, the anarchy, uh, ba basically, the, the story uh, had to come down to, uh, this is before I had done any real reading, but it essentially was the stability problem for anarchy. And I had to have some way, some way to... Uh, resolve the stability problem, uh, and that was kind of the core of how the alien situation managed to work. And I resolved that it was definitely not anarcho-capitalism or libertarianism. In fact, it was um, 
And unless you make some almost biologically uh, magical assumptions, it probably is, was an unworkable solution. But it, it was a story that was interesting, kind of uh, showed my trajectory uh, along the route to other thinking. It really wasn't until 1979 or 1980 that I was e exposed to um, uh, libertarianism, uh, much less anarcho-capitalism. I, I, I had actually good reading programs in my high school, and, and we were exposed to a, a lot of standard issues about, about liberty. But um, 1980, my good friend in San Diego, fellow professor in the math department of Sarabas, who many of you probably know, um, loaned me a copy of, um, and I know she was an object, uh, uh, well, a libertarian for, I've known that for several years, but she loaned me a copy of David Friedman's The Machinery of Freedom. Uh, that, that book was, uh, uh, we, I think we all ha have these situations that, that happen that it's either Anthem or Atlas Shrugged or something, uh, but uh, uh, The Machinery of Freedom just completely, uh, completely blew me away. Um, and I can remember wandering around, probably it was for two or three weeks, kind of recasting every social issue and everything I saw in terms of libertarianism and anarcho-capitalism. And it was such a good feeling. It was uh, sort of an internal ferment type thing. It was really a, a marvelous feeling. Not that I changed anything in the world, but something had changed inside of me. In fact, I, I actually did worry about it a little bit because uh, lots of people in life come across something that is so eye-opening that it explains everything and there are no problems left. And very <laughs> often that's a symptom of something bad. Um, but um, in, in, in this case, it, it mellowed out and uh, I basically have, have spent some proportion of my time for the rest of my life looking at individual situations, especially seeking out situations that um, seem, to, seem to be contradictory. Basically, my, my feelings about right and wrong have not changed, especially since I was five years old and you know, sitting at my parents' dinner table. Um, I, I felt very comfortable, though, with libertarianism because it agreed with what really were the basic notions of right and wrong that I had, uh, I had grown up with. Uh, since then, actually, I think it was after, after this, I, I ran into Atlas Shrugged, and I read that and enjoyed it very much. And also, the first uh, at that time, I ran into the the first of Neil uh, uh, Smith's science fiction novels, which I, I suspect if I had run into that before I had seen David Friedman, uh, that, that that also would have had a, a similarly spectacular effect. As it was, it was uh, an enormously uh, entertaining and moving um, uh, a, a, a story. So, starting from the early '80s, I was in a situation where. Uh, anarcho-capitalism and, uh, and libertarian, libertarianism were uh, quite uh, uh, important uh, uh, to me. Um, I remember in those, in those early years, uh, I was amazed by the um, uniform, uh, by, not, uh, what's the right word for this, by how few disagreements there were between libertarian and libertarians. It was just wonderful that uh, everybody had seen the truth and they had things figured out. And I have since realized that, uh, uh, not, not surprisingly, there are enormous uh, gradations of opinion and in some cases those gradations result in very fiercely, uh, uh, very fierce uh, uh, arguments. And, and, and that is fine. Um, but um, in, in looking at those differences and stuff, I, I found those to be uh, very interesting. And I'm sure that my ideas about libertarianism um, are, 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 are disagree, disagree, would disagree with, with, with some other people that I'd be perfectly happy to also call libertarians. Uh, for instance, one, one feature of my, my personal beliefs is that uh, libertarianism and anarcho-capitalism have their best chance for success in a peaceful and, and highly successful economy. Uh, and this actually fits in with, with the notion of science fiction and the power of the word. Uh, stories are, are something that can change people's minds, and, they, and they're, they're, they're something that's very powerful to change people's minds, whether or not the environment is, is, uh, is, is violent or peaceful. But in a peaceful environment, they are especially 
important for changing people's minds and, and for educating them. So the notion of the, of the LFS and of, of promoting, in the first place, people to just think about issues of, related to liberty, uh, and in the second place, hopefully, to get them to, con to consider certain possibilities, such as the libertarian and anarcho-capitalist uh, point of views. Uh, th those points of view, those are very, very uh, important, and, and uh, uh, science fiction and fiction in general can be uh, set up to have a, 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 an, an, immense, um, an immense effect. One of the things that I, I see as, as time progresses is that uh, uh, generally when I have my little debates with non-libertarians, and I actually try to avoid arguing politics I'm, or, 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 or things like this because I'm so bad at it in person, uh, but um, is that, that oftentimes even if a person will listen to me, they, they, uh, you know, they, they walk away saying that what I'm asking for is so obviously not un unworkable. And I think that we are in an era now that, uh, that, the, 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 that this stuff actually can be made to work, but that first of all, people have to have, uh, have, to have the concept of what's going on. That you could go back to the year 1000 and try to convince some Norman Lord, who in some sense basically a person of goodwill perhaps, about democracy. And he might listen to you all the way through. And when he was done, he would tell you why it was absurd, that if they had a vote, uh, there would simply be some other guy sitting on the hill the next day after they killed the, this Norman Lord. And something happened in the, in the thousand years between then and now. I don't think it's going to take a thousand years uh, for uh, uh, the developments of the sorts of things that most of us are, are, are interested in, and I'm hoping that, that, that stories like this will uh, make, make some sort of contribution to, that, 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 to those developments. So anyway, thank you very much again for the award. The next we come to the uh, Hall of Fame Award. Presenting the Hall of Fame Award uh, will be Fran Brimbleve. Fran uh, was the former chair of the Arizona Libertarian Party. Uh, Fran is an uh, analog author. You've seen uh, her shorter fiction, science fiction, uh, in analog, I'm sure, mm -hmm. and uh, has just uh, told me that there's a, she has in the current issue of Artemis, Artemis number three, which just came out yesterday, a very libertarian uh, science fiction story. Fran? Okay, the nominees for Hall of Fame are Sinclair Lewis, It Can't Happen Here, James P. Hogan, Mirror Maze, Paul Anderson, Orion Shall Rise, and Hans Christian Anderson, The Emperor's New Clothes. And the award goes to Hans Christian Andersen for the Emperor's New Clothes. Okay, here's the award. And um, I'm accepting it for the museum, which it's going to be sent to. There's a little bit of, uh, in the acceptance speech here about the story. It was written in the 1830s. It's a cl very clever story that has entertained and enlightened individuals for generations. The story illustrates the fallacy of embracing falsehoods to maintain the illusions of the powerful, which have become the illusions of the entire social structure. <laughs> the Hall of Fame Award is accepted on behalf of the Hans Christian Andersen Museum in Denmark. The Hans Christian Andersen Museum is one of the Oban City Museums dedicated to the life and work of Hans Christian Andersen. This plaque will be sent there uh, for display. Oh, and Fran uh, Lynn Weaver has a few words to say about this. <laughs> well, Brad, you, you, need, you need no introduction. All right. We were all, we didn't know what to do about Hans Christian Andersen winning this. Because how do you do an acceptance speech? So when it's totally impossible and pointless to do an acceptance speech, they call on me, which is why I am here. You're going to channel it, right? 
Uh, I will, by the way, let me say something about uh, Fran. She's writing stories for Analog, which I believe were, are worthy of John Campbell's astounding and Analog. And not everything currently appearing in Stan Schmidt's Analog, I would say that about. So please buy any issue of Analog she's in. And she can then accept her own award for herself. Uh, Brad Lineweaver won the Prometheus Award in 1989 for Moon of Ice and was editor of Free Space, which published as many Prometheus and Hall of Fame award winners as possible. And I tried to get everybody in it. I didn't quite succeed with, uh, with Werner uh, for some reason, but Greg Benford and I are trying to do a follow-up. So in front of all these people, Werner, will you write for the sequel? <laughs> will you, Werner? Huh? You're going to say no to Greg Benford, are you? Huh? Are you? All right. Getting back to Hans Christian Andersen. <laughs> um, I believe, and Frank can tell me if I'm right about this, isn't the Emperor's New Clothes actually uh, a, a story we don't know the author of? Isn't it part of the history of fairy tales that were researched? And uh, isn't there a story that precedes Hans Christian Andersen that he then was almost like the editor on? Isn't it almost a folk tale? Um, Fred? It might be. Yeah. <laughs> It's always attributed to Hans Christian right. and they will do the, the honoring. Because like the, brother, the Brothers Grimm, many of the classic fairy tale uh, uh, compilers, they're kind of like the Martin H. Greenberg of fairy tale books, uh, these stories go way back into, into European history. And the, the Brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen did a fabulous job of compilation. And I believe that some of the great libertarian stories of the past we don't know who the authors are. Now, basically, this is an award which honors people who we do know the author. But consider how many libertarian things in the past, we really don't know who wrote those items. For example, the Bible, which is a great anthology, uh, and, did, and all these people who put the Bible together, you could say they're editors. There is a story in the Old Testament, you may remember, of Jehovah telling the children of Israel, you don't want a king, trust me. If you get a king, he's gonna tax your ass. He's gonna put your daughter into prostitution. He's gonna put your son into the army. You're gonna be real sorry. And they say, oh no, no, we gotta have a king because we gotta have prestige like everybody else. And it's right in there, it's right in there, the, the warning that God himself warns Israel that having a king is maybe not such a great idea. The book of Samuel, thank you. Samuel Edward Conkin III, for some reason, knew that that was the book <laughs> of Samuel. All right. Now, you could argue, if you want to believe that the, that the Bible for religious Jews and Christians is the inspired word of God, that God is the author of this. But that doesn't change the point that it's an anonymous author in terms of human authorship. I am arguing that some of the greatest statements for libertarianism in history were not quite sure who the writers were. If you're living under a tyrant, you want to speak in code. You want to use a pseudonym. Many great satires and parodies of the past, don't forget Gulliver's Travels, is a brilliant indictment of many status things. But Jonathan Swift is speaking in symbols rather than say outright the political opponents he's attacking. The reason I think the, Emperor knew, the Emperor's New Clothes is worthy of the Hall of Fame, and I remember when it was nominated, a number of people in the LFS told me they thought this was a bad idea because what if it won? <laughs> who, who, who would get up to, to accept for it? I was personally hoping there'd be a gold coin on the plaque and that I would definitely be selected to accept. And I would promise everyone to make sure it got delivered to an heir. And I'd get to work on it right away. Okay, But that didn't work, alas. The reason in the era of Clinton, if I may pick on Clinton for a second, as we're ending the era of Bill Clinton, for some reason, the Emperor's New Clothes and Bill Clinton go together extremely well. <laughs> and the folk wisdom underlying these fairy tales, the people on the bottom, the serfs, the slaves, the people doing the work, the people paying the taxes and paying the tribute, they really know what freedom is. It's what they don't have. And they really want it. And what makes this a great statement for the Prometheus Awards and for the Hall of Fame is libertarianism is not something we invented in the 20th century. It wasn't invented by the Libertarian Party. It wasn't even invented by, by my heroes, Ayn Rand and Robert Heinlein and Louis von Mises. Libertarianism's been around a long time. And we always need to stress that. 
Freedom, people being allowed to do what they want to, so long as they do not violate the rights of their neighbors, and that there's a natural, spontaneous order that normal people gravitate toward if the government will just leave them alone. This is the true message even of anarchy, and I'm not an anarchist. I'm a limited government libertarian. But even I know the best argument for anarchy is most people are not that evil. But we have really evil people who gravitate toward the state, and they become kings, and they become emperors. And can you imagine the terror a population must be in to pretend that that emperor had clothes on when he did not? And then you understand how people can pretend to go along with a Hitler or a Stalin or the lesser tyrants we have to put up with on these shores. Thank you very much. And for Hans Christian Andersen, I thank you again. Thank you all. This uh, concludes the awards we are giving out today. I want to uh, thank all the participants very much. I do want to briefly mention that we do have several uh, Libertarian Future Society uh, uh, members who are published uh, science fiction authors. Uh, we've already mentioned uh, uh, several, Brad and Fran. Also, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, Joe uh, Martino, who is a uh, fan of Joe. <laughs> Joe is also doing double duty by taking photographs for us tonight. So uh, we do uh, thank you all for, for attending, and uh, we uh, appreciate uh, the, the uh, warm uh, reception you've given us. And if you have any questions about the Libertarian Future Society, uh, you can uh, uh, ask us uh, at the conclusion, or you can visit our website at www.lfs.org. Thank you very much. You'll all be the daily frequency tomorrow. Those who haven't gotten the previous issues.